Welcome to episode one of this read-along book club of Stephen R. Donaldson's The Real Story. I'm not going to lie. I'm really loving this story, okay? It's taking me back to my childhood. I'm getting a massive hit of nostalgia reading about these space pirates in a very gritty, rundown setting. But let me know, how are you feeling about this book so far? I know there's been a lot of criticism about its violence, and, and yes, we do see some violence in this group of chapters, but it wasn't anything that really bothered me a whole lot. We'll see if any of the subject matter gets darker, much as many of the Goodreads reviews have uh, talked about, but so far, so good, so far, so good. This is what I would call a quote unquote fun book. I hate the word fun when people say, hey, I wanna see a fun movie, I wanna read a fun book. I absolutely hate it because fun is different things to different people. But if I had to uh, find a book that I called fun for me, this would be it because it does have a little bit of depth, but it has that pulpy kind of just surface level action and grit that, that, that gets me going, that gets me going. So maybe this is a good palate cleanser, especially after attempting to read Inherent Vice by Thomas Pynchon. But let us get into the story. Don't forget to let me know what are you thinking so far about this book. We begin with chapter one. Most of the crowd at Mallory's Bar and Sleep over in Delta Sector had no idea what was really going on. As far as they were concerned, it was just another example of animal passion, men and women driven together by lust. So before I move on, I think it's important to talk about the technique that is used in this book, which to me is far more advanced than I would have expected in a novel like this, a space opera. And I'm going to give Lee over on the Discord credit because uh, he coined it best, I think, and he called it third person plural. Because what's happening is you have this uh, these background characters, this crowd at Mallory's, at this bar, and they are hypothesizing uh, what is going on bet between these characters they see. That being Angus, that being Morn, and that being Nick. So they're sitting in the darkness in the back, sipping their drinks and just talking over to amongst themselves. Why are these people here? What are they up to? What have they done? Where are they going? So it's a really interesting technique because it feels like exposition on the surface until you dig a little bit deeper and you see what Donaldson is doing and he reminds you periodically but only a few people knew there was more to it. Laidover miners, discredited asteroid pilots, drunks and dreamers, and a number of men who had never admitted to being or pirates. The people who either didn't fit or weren't welcome in Alpha, all had learned in curiosity the hard way. For them, the story was basically simple. It began when Morn Highland came into Mallory's with Angus Thermopylae. They obviously didn't belong together because <laughs> this is when they're noting that she's a very beautiful lady and he's a very ugly man. Frog-faced, I believe they call him. She was gorgeous, with a body that made drunks groan and lost yearning and a pale, delicate beauty, a face that twisted dreamers' hearts. So you can tell this is from the perspective of all of these hungry, let's call them hungry men in the bar, because uh, we also know, or we learn, that there are very few women out here. And in contrast, he was a dark and disreputable, probably the most disreputable man who still had docking rights to the station. His swarthy features were broad and stretched, a frog face with stiff whiskers and streaks of grease. According to his reputation, anyone who ever became his companion, crew, or enemy ended up either dead or in lockup. He and Morn looked so grotesque together. Grotesque is a word that Donaldson repeats a few times. She staying with him despite the clear disgust on her face. No one was surprised by the nearly tangible current which sparked across the crowd when she and Nick Socorso spotted each other for the first time. And this is when we were transferring, we were segueing, moving the camera over to Nick. So Nick Socorso was the most desirable man in Delsec, a regular Han Solo. He had his own ship. His personal magnetism made men do what he asked and women offer what he wanted. Ooh big words. Some people said he'd inflicted those cuts on himself just for a fact. That's right, he has cuts on his face. But we learned that the truth was that he'd received those scars years ago, the only time he'd ever been bested. And the woman who gave them to him hadn't considered him worth killing. He learned to wait until he was in control of what happened. Common sense. So even Nick is observing things. Nearly two weeks later, when calm mind security broke into Mallory's and charged Angus Thermopylae with a crime serious enough to make an arrest succeed even in Delsec, Morn Highland was suddenly at Nick's side. They left to become the kind of story drunks and dreamers told each other early in the station's standard morning. The last anyone heard, Angus was rotting as predicted under a life sentence in the station lockup. That, of course, was not the real story. Such a great opening chapter. 
I can't say that I've ever read anything like this. I, I don't wanna say it's completely unique, but it definitely is short, it's punchy. It has a, as a unique voice, like the third person plural vibe. Uh, we're, we're never given a bit of dialogue. We're never giving a P, given a POV from, from any of these main characters. It's all from these background characters. It's incredibly interesting, which brings us to chapter two. Some of the people who lurked in the dim light knew better. These men knew how to listen, how to ask questions, how to interpret what they saw. When Morn Highland and Angus Thermopylae came into Mallory's, the men in the corners noticed the way her whole body seemed to twist away, even when she sat close to him. So again, we're getting a different perspective of these guys. And they observed that he kept one hand constantly fisted in the pocket of his grease-stained ship suit. What could he have in his pocket? Some of these men also left conversations with people who had access to the ID files in Combine Station's computers. But explanations for the fact that Morn Highland wasn't known in Delsec, she'd never been there before. She'd come out from Earth on one of the really wealthy independent ore liners, crossing the gap the Highlands had docked at Calm Mine Station to buy supplies. They were headed for the belt themselves, somewhere they had bought or stolen the location of an asteroid rich enough to tempt them away from their usual runs. A common tale, as far as it went. Back on Earth, civilization and political power required ore. Men and women with some kind of hunger in their bellies were forever buying accurate, quote-unquote, and secret, quote-unquote, charts and then risking everything to cross the gap and go prospecting. They left the profitable ore transportation business because of this. They had a chart, and that chart was good. Greed and casual indifference inspired any number of mine jumpers or pirates to follow the Highland ship, Starmaster as it's known, when she left Calm Mine Station. And Angus Thermopylae had become as rich as the stars without ever doing a lick of honest work. Strange. The Highland ship never came back. But more in Highland had come back. She came back with Angus. The men who observed these things had no other way to account for them. And without any viable external evidence, they chose to believe that he'd given her a zone implant. He had the control in his pocket. Zone implants were illegal. A zone implant was a radio electrode, which could be slipped between, between one of the skull sutures and installed in the brain. An active implant gave an epileptic the look of being completely zoned, quote-unquote. Violent insanities could be tamed. Manic behaviors could be moderated. Catatonia could be relieved or induced. But most interestingly here, pain could be reinterpreted as pleasure. So they think that Angus has this control device because that's the only way. That's the only way this woman would be with him uh, willingly, even though she kind of looks at him in disgust, at least some of these patrons note. But independent human beings could be transformed into intelligent, effective, and loyal slaves. Unauthorized use of the zone implant, though, carried the death penalty. However, no amount of research had discovered a cure for gap sickness, the strange breakdown of the mind which took perhaps one out of every hundred people who crossed the dimensional gap and reduced him to her or her to a psychotic killer or a null wave transmitter, a raving bulimic, or a gleeful self-flagellant or pedophiliac or a pill junkie. So this, this gap sickness really destroys your mind. There was no cure though for the gap sickness, but there was a way to cope with it, the zone implant. So this is what they're thinking happened to this uh, young lady. Perfectly sane and law-abiding people considered it an ex unacceptable risk to cross the gap or ride dark space without access to zone implants. Authorized use, quote unquote, of a zone implant occurred when the whole crew of a ship would have all died if they hadn't used the implant to control a case of gap sickness. What the men in the bars and sleeps of Delsec talked about most often, however, was women. Because we find out women are rare. Uh, single, single women are even rarer. And women, as they know, like Morn Highland, which they have their eyes on. So what must have happened was that Angus Thermopylae found a way to follow the Highland ship when it left Calm Mine Station. So you see these people. This is um, seems like exposition, but it's them coming to these conclusions. All the ships he was reputed to have wrecked his financial resources must have been enormous. And as for his ship, which is called Bright Beauty, what was he doing with all that money? What else? He must be investing it in his quote-unquote business, the kind of equipment which would allow him to follow the Highland ship without making either her or the station self itself suspicious. What happened to the Highland ship and all the rest of her people? No one knew. But Angus Thermopylae must have followed them to their strike. He must have jumped them somewhere, wrecked the ship, marooned or murdered the family, and spared Morn because under the persuasion of the zone implant, she was as desirable as any vision. Because, so speculation ran, he hated her. 
and he hated everything. He hated everybody. Now his hate was fixed on her. He wanted her to be what only a zone implant could make her. The few men in Mallory's who realized that they considered the truth about her were sickened by it. The rest no doubt considered it evil that the control to her implant was in Angus Thermopylae's pocket. And on the subject, Nick Sicorso kept his opinion to himself. That is such a Han Solo name. That is such a dashing uh, pilot's name. Despite his attraction, though, he was probably restrained from immediate action by the prospect of what Angus might do if he were challenged. So you can see all these people looking over to Nick. They've been focused on Morn and, and, and Angus, and now they're looking over at Nick. But what he wanted, so the discerning cynics assumed, was to have Angus arrested by security with the control to Morn's zone implant in his pocket. Morn Highland would be free to give Nick Sicorso the only reward he could possibly want, herself. The hard part was to arrange for Angus to be arrested. Nevertheless, Nick arranged it. His background was vague, and his pretty frigate was known as Captain's Fancy, but he's a dashing lad. The station inspectors had noticed almost immediately that Captain's Fancy had a hole the size of a gaming table on her side. No, I was trying to get inside one of those awkward asteroids. Somehow, the beam dispersion hit a glazed surface and reflected back. I shot myself. Hand over your computer's data core. We will verify your story. I'm not required to let you look at my data core unless you have evidence of a crime. And in the end, Nick passed. He settled into Mallory's and concentrated on enjoying himself while Captain's fancy was being repaired. He was listening, sifting, sorting, evaluating, making contact with sources of information. And the men in the corners could guess what he would do. He wouldn't try to steal her directly. He was too smart for that. In other words, he had too much respect for Angus Thermopylae's defenses. No. Nick would sit and listen, waiting for Angus Thermopylae to make a move. He wanted her. He also wanted to prove himself against Angus Thermopylae. The incoming supply ship from Earth, arriving several weeks early for some reason, was in trouble. One of the crew had been taken by gap sickness. This unfortunate individual had become entranced by the idea of installing a crowbar in the memory bank of the navigational computer. I love that description because he basically just beat the shit out of it with a crowbar, but they said that he, uh, he installed a crowbar. But a full standard year's worth of food, equipment, and medicine was floating out there somewhere against the background of the stars, ripe to be rescued, salvaged, or gutted. Combine Center slapped the curfew onto the docks, forbidding any ship to leave until she could be sworn in as part of the official search. And both Angus Thermopylae and Nick Socorso managed to uncouple from their berths seconds before the injunction of the curfew, thus preserving at least the illusion of authorized departure. Center wasn't impressed by illusions, however. Warning shots were fired right after them, and Nick Socorso disappeared by performing a delicate maneuver called a blink crossing. There was always the chance that dimensional stress would tear the ship apart, but it worked. He got away. And Angus, Angus Thermopylae, took a completely different approach. As soon as the first warning shots were fired, he started transmitting a distress call of his own. There's a short somewhere. Smoke. Controls are locked. I can't navigate. Don't shoot. I'm trying to come around. That idea had to be considered, at least for a few seconds, and during those few seconds, Angus cut in thrust boosters no one knew he had. Like Nick, he got away too. After that, there were no more answers for a while. The people who were following the story could speculate, but for two days they had nothing to base their speculations on. Then Bright Beauty came, limping back. Captain's Fancy also coasted into dock later that same day. The official search was still going on, but that night station security broke into Mallory's to arrest Angus. So here we are coming back to how we ended the first chapter. They had evidence that a crime had been committed, so they said. That gave them the right to board Bright Beauty without permission and take the ship's data core. Food, equipment, and medicine which could only have come from the missing supply ship. At first, the arrest didn't go smoothly. Before Angus was taken, he and Morn Highland began to scuffle. And then she and Nick were gone. Captain's fancy was allowed to slip out of the dock unmolested. So the fair maiden was rescued. The swashbuckling pirate bore her away with all her beauty. There were only two flaws in this story. One was that the supply ship from Earth had arrived on schedule. The other was that the control to Morn's Highland Zone implant was never found. Nick Socorso must have arranged the whole thing, faked the distress call, stolen station supplies himself, planted them on Bright Beauty. Angus could not have gotten rid of the control earlier. After all, the Zone implant and its control were hypothetical, not proven. Perhaps they had never even existed. Why did she stay with him if he had no power over her? No one knew the answers. 
The crowd at Mallory's would have found the real story much harder to live with. Fantastic second chapter. I don't know what to say. More uh, third person plural, uh, seemingly exposition, but again, we're getting like this second story. So let us move on. Chapter three. There were parts of the story that would always remain obscure unless Angus Thermopylae explained them, and he refused. By the end of his trial, Bright Beauty didn't have any secrets left. The data core, though, revealed the extent of Angus's quote-unquote wealth. His resources turned out to be trivial, almost non-existent. But enough evidence was found to convict him of several acts of piracy, though it wasn't adequate to procure the death penalty. And Angus surprised his prosecutors further by refusing to defend himself at trial. He was unwilling either to account for or to defend the presence of stolen station food, equipment, and medicine aboard his ship. And no new illumination was shed on his strange relationship with Morn Highland. No one knew what had warned him when the Highland ship had come into Calm Mind Station or how hard he had tried to get away from her. It looked like a prize, the kind of treasure ship, Bright Beauty, could peel apart weld by weld, so he is ready to uh, scavenge this ship, but destroying what other men would have captured as riches because his need for money had limits while his desire to see what matter can and fire could do was immense. This time his instincts burned and he always trusted his instincts. As far as he knew, he had no particular reason to be wary. Only his data core could damage him and he had long ago taken steps to alleviate that design. He turned his field mining probes toward the Highland ship it informed him that the Star Master's hull was formed of an alloy he'd only heard about, never seen. An alloy so expensive, no ore liner could afford it. When he saw the readings, Angus Thermopylae fled, though. A ship as rich as Star Master would have friends, muscle, escorts, fighters, hanging off station to watch for trouble. He left Calm Mine along a route that would attract as little attention as possible. He was hoping that the belt was far enough away to hide him. His instincts had warned him, and he had always obeyed. Angus Thermopylae was a pirate and a mine jumper. He hated everybody and there was enough old blood on his hands to convict a whole prison full of illegals. He was alone now because the decrepit drunk he'd hired to crew for him had made the mistake of asking the wrong question at the wrong time. So he'd flattened the man's head with a spanner and left the body in one of the thruster tubes to be ashed the next time the drive cut in. So this is when we were learning that Angus, he's pretty hardcore and he does some hardcore stuff uh, later in this uh, sequence of chapters. But he was also a coward, as noted here. So he ran from the Highland ship under as much G as his body could stand and remain conscious. And he arrived without crashing at a part of the belt which everybody knew had been mined out years ago. There he picked a particularly dead asteroid, parked bright beauty in a mining crater. And hours later, he awoke screaming because there were skin worms all over him crawling nine starting to burrow in a predictable consequence of the drugs so he was taking all these drugs to stave off all of the uh, issues in his fleeing the next time he awakened he had trouble breathing because the air in bright beauty was going bad Uh oh but unfortunately his problems were just beginning he only had two choices either return to combine station or find some other source of supply and in delsec he would be sneered at but he could live with that however there was still the highland ship that ship was to blame, of course. She'd scared him, and he'd hated everything that scared him. He began to plot ways to make Star Master pay for what was happening to him. At last, he found what he needed, a mine on a craggy and pockmarked asteroid with a look of depletion about it, as if it had already had its riches cut out. Yet the people working there had a ship. The ship was cold. It had been shut down a considerable time ago. The people on it now, probably a family, people who had to spend long periods of time on ships or in mines tended to do things by families, were essentially scavengers. They had food and fresh water and scrubber pads. He went in hard. The miners saw him coming. As he approached, he used torpedoes to collapse the mouth of the mine. His breaking blast incinerated the habitation domes, charred the suited figures outside. This guy is, he's a hardcore asshole, man. He, he cares about nobody but himself. The radio shouts died in a gabble of static. Got you, you bastards. A quick scan for life readings, distress calls, suit-to-suit -suit communications, none. Good. Bright Beauty's klaxons went off like several dozen screams of pain. And he was already in the seat, strapped down, and King thrust for takeoff by the time the computer told him what was going on. And sensors had detected the approach of another ship. And not just any other ship, a ship the same size and configuration as Starmaster. And she was coming at him fast. How the fucking hell did she get here? How did she find me? Let that fornicating hunk of money 
tried fornicating. I think he means something else. Money tried to chase him and see what happened. The only problem was that he didn't have enough food or water or air. Star Master was still in considerable distance away, but her first transmission reached him before he was 100 meters off the asteroid. Set down. Bright beauty, you are ordered to set down. This is Captain David Hyland, Commanding Officer, United Mining Company's Police Destroyer, Star Master. You have committed murder. If you do not set down to be boarded, you will be fired upon. Message repeats, the radio announced. No. Angus coughed in desperation. With one heavy finger, he stabbed at his console, cut off reception. I don't care if you come for fucking God. You can't have my ship. He wrenched Bright Beauty around scarcely 200 meters off the asteroid and slammed on full boost. Then he drove away toward the heart of the belt. He started blazing away at every meteor and asteroid in range. It worked for a while. Out of the black, light came in bright flares. Matter fire hitting rock. The rock went incandescent as it burst into its component particles. Static sizzled across Bright Beauty's scan. Light collapsed to black again. Then a dead stone lump the size of a small space station, hardly a thousand kilometers ahead, took a shaft of incandescence through its center and broke apart so violently that chunks as big as ejection pods came at him like thunderbolts. At the last instant, however, one rock slapped her in the side and sent her tumbling like a derelict through the belt. He was unconscious. As far as he knew, he was still trying to scream. Which brings us to chapter four. Moments later, he came back to himself. Just in time, Bright Beauty was plunging toward the kind of collision that would crumple her like an empty can. Only a few hundred meters off an asteroid almost large enough for colonization. Bright Beauty had a cabin-sized dent in her side, but her shields held. And one of the cameras gave him a glimpse of the UMCP ship. She was coming for him, coming fast. Almost without realizing it, he hit his distress beacon. Don't shoot, don't shoot, you fornicating, <laughs> fornicating filthy bastards. Don't kill me, I surrender. See? We're already uh, seeing how much of a coward he is after all. His cameras gave him a perfect view of a star master altered course, turned in the direction of the asteroid, and broke in half. Broke in half. Angus watched in complete astonishment as the ship crashed and died. The fire went out almost immediately. That implied oxygen. He knew star master should have burned longer than that. If parts of star master retained integrity, then some of her people might have been protected or shielded. He discovered that his instruments registered alive. Three or four people were still alive. Definitely four. He never considered trying to rescue the survivors. His thoughts were more basic. Air, water, food. Caught between need and cowardice, he was paralyzed. Then he thought about what had been done to him. His heart began to swell with old rage. He shifted Bright Beauty into landing attitude and started her moving. Gently, he set Bright Beauty on her struts beside the UMCP ship. He took an impact rifle with him. Cycling through the airlocks, he eased himself onto the surface of the asteroid. He could only see Star Master as a silhouette, blacker than space. She looked huge and treacherous, riddled with secrets. Bright Beauty had been hurt. She would never be the same again. Star Master's survivors were going to pay for that. Without much trouble, he found an airlock in the intact part of the ship. His instincts were good. A man stood waiting for him. And at first glance, the man looked all right. His silver hair was rumpled, but that only increased his appearance of eagle authority. Captain's bars marked the shoulders of his tunic. In one fist, he held a beam gun. Angus nearly cried out, Don't shoot! I'm Captain Davies Highland, the man said. Angus Thermopylae, you're under arrest. We're going to commandeer your ship. The pair boiled skin around his eyes betrayed what had happened to him. Flash blinded in the crash. So this is when Angus sees his opportunity. Cackling hideously behind his faceplate, Angus fired. The impact rifle spattered a fine spray of blood 30 meters down the corridor. I'm sorry, Captain Davies Highland, he said in gleeful courtesy. You can't have my ship. So this guy, brutal, brutal. This is what I was talking about. Uh, some of the lines are kind of cheesy, but it, it feels, it, f it fits the tone of the story anyway. A, a 90s sci-fi kind of gritty story, just full of full of bad characters like this Angus fellow. But uh, one thing that I loved about this is that the description of this guy just blowing up and another one happens after that is that it's just, it's so simple. It's just like, yeah, the impact rifle spattered a fine spray of the captain. And that's that. Uh, there, there's no kind of emotional beat or anything like that. It, it really emphasizes, I feel anyway, Angus's just lack of 
empathy for anyone other than himself. There were a few pieces of the captain's body left on the floor. Angus kicked them out of the way, again, emphasizing that even further, and went looking for the other two survivors. The bridge was in this part of Starmaster. He went there first. And there was a man hunched over the helm console in no condition to threaten anyone. He was dying where he sat, and Angus pushed the man out of his GC. Laughing inside his suit, he blasted the man to pulp and splinters. There you go. Simple as that. One more to go. Then air filters, food lockers, a line to the water tanks, and everything else worth taking. Refocusing short-range scan inward, he used it to locate the last survivor. There, in a room the scan computer identified as the auxiliary bridge. Morin Highland, this is when we meet the young lady, uh, stopped him without lifting a finger. She stared through him with stark, blank horror on her face, as if he's not even there. She was the only one here. There weren't even any bodies. She was in shock. But then she spoke. Let me die. I don't want to help. Let me die. Go away. Abruptly, he keyed the suit's mic. Why? What did you do to them? Without warning, she gripped the sides of her head and began to wail. Shut up! He branched his rifle. They're all dead. Nobody can hear you. I shot your father myself. Shut up. He survived? He was alive? Until I blew him apart. She flung herself out of her cheek seat, clawing at his faceplate. He wasn't ashamed of having killed her father. Captain Davies fornic fornicating Highland. I'm going to have to start using that, I think, more. Uh, nobody's going to know what the hell I'm talking about. But, you know, a great inside joke for myself. He had damaged bright beauty. He deserved worse than he got. And yet... He didn't shoot her still. Something about her is captivating. Maybe he was simply tired of being alone. Or maybe she presented possibilities of revenge, which he hadn't yet the chance to appreciate. For a moment, he grappled with her, fought to pin her arms. He drew back one heavy fist and clubbed her to the floor, hitting her. That kind of violence was so seductive that he wanted to do it again. Now, I've seen a lot of really negative reviews on this book, and I know we're not very far into it. I guess we're only about 25%. Apparently, there's a lot of rape in it, maybe. I, it seems to be heading in that direction. A lot of people just did not like the the utter brutality in this book, and, and clearly it, it's apparent. Um, I, I don't want to say this is not even close to the worst br brutality I've read in books, but I can understand how somebody wanting to read a space opera or, or you know, a sci-fi novel of this sort uh, would be taken aback because this is def definitely not the kind of stuff you read in science fiction that often. Starmaster herself may have sent out a distress call. Better to forget about her. Forget about looting the ship. Take all the filters and supplies you could get and leave fast. Muttering obscenities at Morn Highland, hating her because it was all her fault, he slung her over his shoulders and went looking for an EVA locker. And he goes back to bright beauty. Angus retrieved his rifle and then set about taking everything that could conceivably be of any value out of Starmaster. Enough filters to keep his air clean for years, food stores of a much higher quality than he would have been willing to pay for, expensive liquor, clothes, spare parts, medicines, and guns. He lifted off the asteroid and went hunting with glazed eyes and unsteady hands for a place to hide. He made sure her straps were still secure, shot her full of cats so she wouldn't disturb him. And then he climbed into his bunk and collapsed. Wow. This novel was very unexpected. I did not, <laughs> I did not imagine uh, that this story was going to be like this. Again, uh, some people on my Discord mentioned that uh, there were some reviews on Goodreads and Amazon that were not too happy about the violence. Uh, but no, I'm not saying the violence has taken me aback at all or anything like that. But like I said at the very beginning, I am I'm very struck by nostalgia. This this kind of science fiction is sort of of the era when I was a kid and. It is so, so great to come back to it. I'm really, really excited to keep reading this book. It is such a great change from, uh, <laughs> I don't want to talk too much crap about Tom and Pynchon's work. It's just, it wasn't for me, but this is the kind of stuff I love to read. And, and the funny thing is too, is I tend to like reading deeper stories, right? Stuff about the human condition, stuff that is, uh, you know, uh, metaphorical, uh, trying to uh, talk about bigger things and explore deeper subjects. But there's something about reading just some badass science fiction that really hits me in the right spot. And um, I, I'm really, again, looking forward to reading this. I would love to hear your thoughts in the comments below. I know I kind of sprung this read along on you uh, impromptu. So hopefully you had a chance to pick the book up and start reading it. It's a quick read. 
Uh, I know this is going to be a divisive book. Uh, I love darker material, so I don't think this is going to phase me in the slightest. We'll see where it goes as we progress through the stories. Now it is time to figure out where we're going to read to, and I promise I'm not going to skip chapter chapters in this book. So let us read chapters 5 through 9, which will get us to page 121. That's about another 60 pages from now. So like I said, this is a pretty quick read. Hopefully that's not too fast-paced for you. But if it is, let me know in the comments. I, I'm trying to plan, like I mentioned, to keep this uh, video to four, four episodes. But if the pace is too much, let me know in the comments and uh, we can slow it down a little bit because I think we're going finish to this, finish this anyway uh, well before October because October is horror month. But anyway, loving this book so far. Um, I, I'm so glad that Inherent Vice didn't work out for me because a lot of times you guys submit all these fantastic titles and I'm like, man, I want to read all of these. And inevitably, we always read one, and, and some of these I make note of and, and, you know, read them down the line, hopefully, anyway. But I'm really, really, really glad this is happening. So hopefully you are enjoying it, too. I love the energy. I love the tone. I know. I know. It's, it's funny to hear me talk about this book like this because there's not really a lot of depth here, at least nothing I'm seeing. And I'm usually drawn to books that have a lot more depth and nuance, but... Again, there's just something fun about some kick-ass sci-fi. And, and who knows, maybe the story's going to develop. I know it's a, it's a five-book series with books that have way more pages than this one here. But anyway, thanks for watching. <laughs> thanks for reading along with me. And I will see you next week with chapters five through nine of The Real Story.